Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to Baloney Basketball. I'm here today with a special guest, a familiar face on the channel, my guy Sports Wikipedia. How's it going, my man? Doing good. You know, I think it's been at least a year, maybe a two, since I was a guest on your sh show. Mm -hmm. I think it was near the been, end of the so uh, long. Yeah, it was. It was near the end of the the uh, last season or whatever. So. You know, we're in the final week of the season, you know, stakes are getting higher and one team where, um, you know, it's really getting intense for is the Minnesota Timberwolves who just clinched a playoff berth, uh, but it's all a matter of, are they going to be the one seed, two seed or three seed, which is kind of what they're hanging around. They've been without Carl Anthony Towns for a while now, and they're still playing really well. So I'll ask you, you know, with Cat out and we really don't know like when he'll come back, like, do you think the Timberwolves can sustain this high level of play well even with the absence of Carl Anthony Towns in my opinion the Timberwolves doesn't seem to have any issue or struggle at winning they're still playing at a noteworthy performance Anthony Edwards who I would consider pretty much a superstar most of the time vast majority of this season I think he's averaging like 26 points 5 rebounds 5 assists He's a solid three-point shooter due to his strength and athleticism. He's very efficient when attacking the basket, even when he's going through contact. He's a solid playmaker. Of course, you got Rudy Gobert, who many consider to him to be the most impactful defensive player, and it's really hard to argue against that. I mean, high possibility, once again, he's going to win, I think, what, his third or fourth defensive player of the year. Mm -hmm. He's going to finish at least top three in defensive player of the year. I mean, Tim Wolves this season arguably have the number one defense, and of course, that's largely due to Rudy Gobert. Um, Nas Reid, I think that's his name. I feel like ever since the absence of Carl Anthony Towns, he has really stepped up, done more. He helps the Tim Wolves offense momentum going, and you got, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, I'm trying to remember the dude's name. Um, which one? I think Kyle what? Anderson. I think that's yeah, his yeah, name. Yeah. yeah, Kyle Anderson. I th he's actually doing more recently. He's been putting up double digit points more often compared to like the first fifty plus games in the season. I think the last like six, seven out of the twelve games since Carl Anthony Towns has been gone, Kyle Anderson has scored at least double digit points. And right now, Timberwolves do have, I think, 51 or 52 wins. And this is the first time the T-Wolves got 50-plus wins since 2004, which was a year, you know, Kevin Garnett won MVP. So it's been 20 years. from The last 20 years, unfortunately, for the Timberwolves, has been mostly heartbreak and struggle. I'm pretty sure from 2005 to 2021, the Timberwolves only reached the playoffs one time. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Yeah, that was the so I think Jimmy Butler year. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and I so I think I, even when Carl, if Carl Anthony Towns does come back in the playoffs, the furthest I think the T Wolves will go is the semifinals. But that's definitely a huge leap compared to what T Wolves, no offense, have done in the last twenty years. Right. Yeah. I mean. Even in their whole history, I think only the year when Garnett was MVP, that's the only time they've ever won a playoff series. So, like, definitely, if they were even just able to do that, I think already, like, most people would probably say this is probably the second best Timberwolves season ever uh, that we've seen. So, um, you know, especially the way they've played without Cat. Now, is that sustainable? Um, I feel like it kind of is, because I feel like even last year, like, without Cat in those games, like, it really put more emphasis on like Gobert is the rim protector, but there's more versatile defenders around him. So like someone like McDaniels, who's more so playing like on the perimeter, like he can also switch more so into like guarding a four if need be or something like that. And I think it makes it a little bit harder for the other team to go against that. But I feel like, you know, just with this team, they get people like Mike Conley and Monte Morris. That might be, um, I mean, not like, the best like point guard tandem in the league, but for a team, but I think they're like the most in control, if that makes sense. Like they're kind of, um, you know, Monte Morris is the assist 
the turnover ratio king basically is what they call him and then you know Mike Conley like he's just kind of more of a veteran laid back under control um so I feel like having those guys <clears throat> for a playoff series you already know how good Ant is we know what Gobert brings on defense and then if Cat comes back too I don't know I think they're gonna they're gonna be a tough team the reason why I want to consider uh, the Timberwolves contenders is because I w- would say that uh, Anthony Edwards is the number one player. And as good as Anthony Edwards is, I don't think he's good enough to be a first option on a championship team. And while I do think t Wolves have an impressive roster, they don't have enough depth. Their roster isn't strong enough for me to consider more dangerous than teams like the Nuggets or even... Um, the Clippers when they're healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think at least right now it's hard to say they're. Um, it's hard to feel like they're contenders when they haven't really shown anything, and it's hard to say like Ant is that number one guy. Now maybe in like three or four years from now, like we'll be looking at it differently. But I think right now it's kind of fair to say that um, they're not quite in that boat. But they definitely could win a playoff series. I think um, now if they have to play like team like that, like Denver, the Clippers. Maybe even Dallas, who we'll talk about later here. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It might be a little bit tougher to beat them in like a second round. So, I don't know. Also, I think the Timberwolves need more experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's going to – I think it's going to – this playoff run is going to be really interesting for them. They're probably the most interesting team to look for in the West. But um, if you want, though, like we can shift to another Western Conference team. That I kind of just mentioned right there, the Dallas Mavericks, who – Right now, they're on a seven-game winning streak. They've recently, in the past few weeks, they went from barely holding on to the eighth seed over teams like the Lakers and Warriors to now they've jumped all the way up to the fifth seed and getting closer by a couple games, like to the Clippers, maybe to have a home court advantage series. Um, you know, obviously, they made additions to the trade deadline, you know, full season with Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic together, and now Kyrie's healthy after he missed a lot of time earlier in the year. So, do you think the Mavericks are a legit team? Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Mavericks, they're on pace to win about 50 games. Last year, the Mavericks won, I think, 38 games. So high possibility the Mavericks are going to win at least 10 more games. So yeah, So already you can automatically say this is definitely an improvement for the Mavericks compared to last season. Uh, There was a lot of doubters. A lot of people were doubting the Mavericks before the season started and even during this season. A lot didn't think the Mavericks were going to win up to 45 games. And I think that's where the Mavericks are at right now. I think Mm -hmm. right now they got 45 wins. And I'm sure the reason why many, the reason why majority or a lot were doubting the Mavericks or or questioning them is because their lack of defense. Because... Of course, the Mavericks, their two best players are Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving. And really none of those guys provide much on the defensive side, especially I would say more so Luka because I think Kyrie gives more effort on defense. But, you know, that's fine because both Luka and Kyrie are are so good on the offensive side, especially Luka. And (laughs) speaking of Luka, I'm sure you've heard this many times, but that dude's not human. Like the way he can create points for himself and his teammates is incredible. Like stopping Luca from scoring 30 plus points along with eight plus assists on like a 50 plus focal percentage is literally impossible. Nine out of 10 times Luca, he's going to steal the show. This dude, I think he's averaging 34 points and Lead about <laughs> almost 10 assists. Yeah. He, this dude's putting up video game numbers. I know stats don't tell the full story, but Luca. Whenever I watch Luca play on the offense, I'm like, man, like who can stop this guy? There's no, I don't think there's really anyone that can stop Luca putting it on a show. It's really hard, and and is and I do think for sure easily Luca is the best player in the Mavericks, but you can't forget about what Kyrie Irving has been doing this season. He's averaging over 25, 26 points along with five, six assists. He's also very efficient. He's another player who's very difficult to guard because of his amazing footwork and handles. I mean, many people say that Kyrie is the greatest ball handler. And 
while I, I do think that most of the season, the Mavericks defense has been no better than 20th. From what I've seen and heard, the last 15 to 20 games, the Mavericks defense, in my opinion, has at least somewhat stepped up. Hmm. And I think for the Mavericks, for me to consider Mavericks contenders, their defense needs to be at least average. Because there are teams that can keep up with the Mavericks high power offense like the Nuggets or OKC. But to me, Nuggets and OKC or even the Clippers have better, uh, their defense is better. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's not, um, you know, even if they do have like, let's say they're 15th in defense by the end of it or by the time we hit the playoffs, like that's what they're playing as. Um, you know, it's not like it's feasible that they could compete. I mean, the Nuggets last year, I think they were like 13th in defense and they went on to win the championship. So I think it's definitely possible. But I think, um, you know, at the start of the year, I was a little concerned about this team because it felt like they had too many shooters that just really couldn't really do much on the defensive end. Now they've kind of gained that identity. They've given Josh Green more of a role and Jaden Hardy. And, uh, you know, they brought in Dante Exum, who has been like a shooter in a lot of these games. I can't believe the way he's played this year too, like kind of out of nowhere, it felt like. And then you get guys like Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington at the trade deadline. Like it, I think that was really too what also like gave them that extra boost because before the, those moves, they might have been hanging around like the play in. But I think now they've asserted themselves as like, okay, we're better than a play in team. We're not going to be in that situation. And, you know, just with Luca and Kyrie, especially, I think they've kind of figured it out a little bit more so now I think earlier in the year you were seeing a little bit maybe the same concerns from last year and maybe Kyrie wasn't playing all too well Luca was still playing well all season but Kyrie was kind of a little bit down but since like January 1st I think I was just checking the other day like Kyrie's averaging like 27 6 and 5 on like I think it's like 53 42 91 splits which is pretty crazy but no one else has really mentioned him I mean he wasn't even an all-star this year so I think like they've gone a little bit under the radar because of how last season went. Maybe people are not going to take them as seriously, but I feel like they're a pretty tough team. Like I feel like right now the Nuggets and the Clippers right now in the West might be the only two teams I would put ahead of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am low key kind of concerned how Kyrie's going to perform in the playoffs. Cause I think the last time or two, Kyrie was in the postseason. He, uh, I think he really choked. Yeah, that is fair. I do think the I'm not one worried about thing, Luke. Yeah, Luca's gonna go off. I think the one thing in Kyrie's favor though is that the last few times, like when he was at Brooklyn, and even like you, you know it when he was with your Celtics. Like I think there was a lot of pressure on him. Like I feel like now there's not nearly as much pressure on if they don't achieve what they're, um, what he had hoped to get. Like with Boston or with Brooklyn. So maybe that might play in his favor a little bit, but um, yeah, I don't know if you want, uh, we can, we can shift here to talk about a team that, uh, you know, I said Dallas, they jumped from like eighth to fifth in recent weeks. One of those teams that they jumped was the Sacramento Kings who, you know, now they're going to have these injuries to Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. Uh, there's no like real timeline on both of them. I think they said, Herder is expected to miss the rest of the season, though. But I think Monk, there's a chance he could come back, but we really don't know. So, but with these injuries, I mean, both of them really play like the same position. So I feel like that's a huge blow. But what do you think about how this could hurt the Kings' chances? And maybe do you think it hurts their ability to make the playoffs for consecutive years? Okay. Speaking of Malik Monk, I actually looked it up last night. And it's saying that he's going to miss up to four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. Right. So I don't know if you know that, Mm. but both Malik Monk and who's the other guy, Kevin Herter. Yes. They provide solid contributions to the Kings. And of course, uh, Malik Monk, a lot of people are saying that he's going to win six men of the year. Um, uh, I wonder how many games chance. he's at right now. Do you know by any chance? Or I'll, uh, I'll try to look it up real quick. Well, I think for the, for the sixth man of the year, it doesn't matter how many games they play. The whole 65-game thing, I don't think that matters for that award. 
I, I guess he's above it anyways, though, even if it did matter. But continue, sorry. <laughs> I, I think the only two players I would consider more important on the Maverick, on the sorry, the Keens over Malik Monk are Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox. To me, those only two players on the Kings are more valuable, more important for the Kings over Malik Monk. Uh, Malik Monk this season, like he's capable of giving you around 20 points, five assists. I think the Kings would have to play at least one playoff series. If the Kings do reach the playoffs, I think they're seven seed right now Hmm. for Malik Monk to come back. And I don't think the Kings are going to win a playoff series at best they're gonna barely reach the playoffs i mean yeah there's moments times where the kings looked really good but to me the kings have been more inconsistent compared to teams like the nuggets okc clippers pelicans heck even the mavericks yeah um yeah i mean i don't know i just think like and i even said before the season that As great as the Kings played last year, like the biggest thing in their favor was that they were the healthiest team. Obviously, there was no 65 game rule. So, a lot of these teams, like they weren't, their best players weren't playing 65 games. You know, you know what I mean? So, like a lot of them weren't as healthy. Now, you see a lot of the star players, maybe they've missed like five games or less throughout the year. And really, the Kings are on pace to have like the same record as they did last year, which might not seem like it, but last year that got him a three seed this year that's on pace to give him an eight seed so I think it's just a part of it where it's like maybe they haven't I guess impressed this year but they've kind of stayed the same um and they've had some injuries of their own so maybe if they were healthy they'd be a little bit better but I think like that's just kind of the price that comes with the NBA like you never know what's going to happen and I think Kevin Herter last year in the playoffs like he really didn't give them what they needed so I guess I'm not too concerned about him being out, but I am a little concerned with Malik Monk being out because, um, you know, while maybe Fox and Sabonis are like their two all-stars, I think Monk kind of was like their second scoring option like last year against the Warriors, um, and especially like in the games where, you know, Sabonis, like he was playing through an injury and maybe he wasn't playing his best in some of the games. Like I think the reason they were even, you know, in those games and competitive was also – Obviously, Fox was going crazy, but also Malik Monk was kind of taking it to another level. So someone is going to have to fill in that role. I don't know who, but I'm looking at where they are right now. If they're playing the Suns in the play-in and they have those guys missing, I don't know if they'll win. And then they've had the Lakers number this year, so I guess there's a chance that they could beat them in a play-in scenario, but it's going to be a lot harder um, you know, without maybe two of your five or six best players on the team. Same thing with the Warriors, too. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one team the Kings better hope and pray they don't have to face against in the playoffs is the Clippers, because I don't know if you know this, but the Clippers are two and one against the Kings. In the two games the Clippers won, uh, Kawhi Leonard put up at least thirty points and shot at least seventy five percent in those two games. And Sabonis seems to struggle against the Clippers, so that's probably the last team the Kings want to have to face in the playoffs. And uh, like you said, last year, uh, Fox, he went crazy in his first playoff series. I think last year was De- uh, De'Aaron Fox's first playoff series. Mm. Average like, what, 27 points, uh, 28 points or something like that. Mm. And But Sabonis, early, he hasn't done shit in the playoffs. <laughs> and I, I speaking of Sabonis, um, well, I, I just said he hasn't done shit in the playoffs, I think – I will admit, in my opinion, a lot, quite a bit has underrated Sabonis. I I think this season, you can argue he's been better this season compared to last season, but it's crazy because he got, he didn't make it to the all-star team this year, but he got it last year, I think. And he's one of the most versatile players right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think, like... If, if they want to do anything in a playoff play-in scenario, like it, Sabonis is going to have to step up for sure. He can't be playing the way he played against Kevon Looney last year because I would say he probably got outplayed by Kevon Looney, which is like 
pretty insane because now Looney's hardly even playing for the Warriors and they're the 10th seed. So, um, but it's not looking good for the Kings. I, I do think that they still have a pretty good chance, obviously, to make the playoffs with their two stars there. But Sabonis is going to have to play like he does every time against like the Lakers, who they'll more than likely play for that eight seed game if they lose to Phoenix. But yeah, um, I don't know. If you want, we... I want to say one more thing. Oh, go ahead, and then and then we'll move on after. All right. Uh... Speaking of Malik Monk, well, I, m- majority of the time, either Fox or Sabonis will be the top player for the Kings. I do think there were times where Malik Monk stepped up and was the, the best player on the Kings on certain games. Mm-hmm. I, I think he's capable of doing that. If Malik Monk needs to step up to be the, the guy, I think he can do that. Yeah. I forget what game it was. There was a game he literally just – took over this year and he had like 40 points without i think fox or sabonis playing so he's capable of that so they're they're gonna need him but um if you want we'll uh move on here to another guy who is expected to maybe return in april at least that's what his coach says and the coach nick nurse is expecting joel Embiid to return in april now that's kind of vague because you know you look at where the sixers are right now they're in the play-in so April could mean April 3rd and he's back for the remainder of the season and uh, the play, the play in playoffs, whatever, which it's not going to be. Or April could also mean he's back for the play in. April could also mean he's back after they're eliminated. So do you expect Joel Embiid to return in April? And if he does, do you think it's important for them to get above the play in before he comes back? Now, um, I remember when Embiid first got hurt, like the first week or two, when Embiid got hurt, when they had the idea of when he could return. I remember I seen at least a few on social media saying that, and I know this is true, but I've seen a few were saying that Embiid actually could have came back sooner. But the reason why Embiid didn't come back sooner is because once he realized he was going he wasn't going to play enough games. He wasn't going to win MVP again. He set out longer than what he probably should have because he realized that he wasn't going to win MVP again. So he figured to rest until the end of the season mm-hmm. when the 76ers need him. And 76ers, they definitely do need him beat right now because they're sitting at the eighth seed. Yeah. And I, one thing I want to say that if the 76ers do reach the playoffs, there's going to be a lot of pressure on Joel Embiid because while in the regular season Embiid is amazing, he really hasn't been living up to the hype or expectations in the postseason, especially in the last two years. Last year, his points per game dropped by, I think, 10. I think, of course, people were saying that was because he was hurt, but I don't know if I want to use that realizing excuse no offense or what about the year before in 2022 when he also dropped in by a lot mm. i don't expect joel and b to average 35 points in the playoff in the playoffs like he was doing this season if mb is averaging 28 to 31 points along with double digit rebounds four to five assists on impressive efficiency then i think more people will have faith in Joel Embiid in the playoffs. Yeah, I I just think too it's like they're just in a hard situation because if they're playing like if they did get the eight seed, they would play your Celtics first round, and that's a team he's never beat, and he would have to come back from injury to try and beat, which I don't expect that happening. And then also you play the Bucks now. He's never played the Bucks in a playoff scenario, so maybe that could actually work in his favor, but I wouldn't really bet on them winning that either. I think for them to have a good chance if he does come back, like they would need to play almost any of those other teams. Maybe it's like Cleveland or the Knicks or the Heat, the Pacers, or like whoever it might be. Um, like that's probably the best bet they would have. Orlando potentially, but I just don't think he will come back. I think he's been out so long. Um, if for some reason he did come back, maybe after the play-in or something, um, then they just got to secure a playoff spot. I don't know if they would even beat the Heat in a play-in game if they were the road team. And then 
that means they would have to play either my bulls or the hawks for that eight seed and i mean it's i mean i would probably bet on philly still winning i think they have enough with maxi and tobias harris and those guys but it's not a foregone conclusion either so i wouldn't be surprised if maybe that's kind of how things went for the sixers but um i don't know i just think like with Embiid, um yeah, I know people have said like the last couple of years he's been injured in the playoffs and maybe it's, you know, true. Maybe that definitely has affected his play. But I mean, if he comes back, do you really think it's going to be different then? I mean, he's missed all this time and it's it's going to just be like the fourth year in a row where he's, oh, well, he came back from an injury and you know what I mean? So it, it's yeah, like, yeah, it's kind of isn't like an excuse and maybe it's a like excused uh, excuse if there's such thing as that, but I, I think after a while, it's like, you know, it just keeps happening. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you just are going to expect that you get to the playoffs and then Joel Embiid's not going to be 100%. So, yeah. yeah it's it's going to be like, oh, look at Joel. Look at people are going to be like, oh, look at Joel Embiid. He's averaging over 30 points. Uh, he's like the best scoring big man since Shaq. He's doing all this stuff in the regular season. But once the playoffs come, like, oh, well. I mean, of course, you know, I, I like to think that when B comes back, that definitely increases the Sixers' chances as contenders. Because if B didn't get hurt, the Sixers would be, my opinion, no worse than third in the East. Mm. Yeah, they they would definitely be more up there, maybe even second, because there's a huge gap between, you know, you guys and the Bucks. It's like 12 games right now. So I could see them very well even being the second seed. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and also, I'm gonna give a lot of, sorry, no good. I'm gonna give a lot of credit to Tyrex Max, Tyrex Maxi. He deserves a lot of credit. Yeah, I agree. He's kind of put the team on his shoulders lately. Um, but you know, with this, you know, next topic that we got, we'll keep it like I guess kind of in this theme of Sixers. Um, maybe not for long. He won't have to carry as much on his shoulders. Uh, next season, of course, obviously Embiid would be healthy, but also maybe with another player that's been rumored there. Um, you know, things with Paul George and the Clippers seem a little bit weird right now. I mean, I don't know if you saw the other day, like Ty Lu said something like, ask Paul George about like our team identity and stuff like that. And so there's, they haven't really extended him yet. So there's rumors that people think maybe Paul George and the Clippers uh, are kind of nearing the end. Uh, there's not a 100% guarantee on that, though. But one team that's been rumored there is the Sixers. And so I guess, like, what do you think about Paul George's future? And do you think if he went to a team with the Sixers and they were able to keep Maxie and Joel Embiid with him, like, what do you think that team would do? Um, But first, I want to talk about the Clippers. Mm-hmm. In my opinion... I think this is like the fifth season with Kawhi and Paul George together because mm. I think 2020 was their first year together, right? Correct, yeah. Okay, so this is their fifth year together, and I think this is the best chance with you know Kawhi and Paul George because both Kawhi and Paul George are, for the first time since together, are 100%. Like the previous four to five seasons or three seasons, neither Kawhi or poor George hardly have ever been 100% fully healthy, especially Kawhi Leonard, unfortunately. Mm. Um, Kawhi Leonard, he played at least 65 games this season, and I think that's the first time he's played at least 65 games since 2017. Yeah. It seems like <laughs> it sucks, too. Because, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but, like, Kawhi's – definitely been one of my favorite players to watch when he's actually healthy i think he's definitely when he's fully healthy Kawhi's definitely one of the best players agree um yeah uh Kawhi leonard like in the play when the clippers i think the clippers are going to get to the playoffs i don't have any concern for Kawhi leonard because i would consider him more more so a playoff riser actually one of the biggest playoff risers recently in the last like seven eight years paul george on the other hand no offense has um oh my god dude this dude paul george this dude like i question what he does in the playoffs shooting bricks questionable (laughs) plays getting owned by opposing players if paul george 
does what he does. No offense, what he does a lot in the playoffs, especially in the last like five to six years, where he's shooting bricks, questionable shot selection, bad shot selection, and getting owned by opposing player. And if the Clippers lose, then Paul George has him only himself to blame. Yeah, and the sad thing is that this happened often you know what i mean like there's just been too many times where like most people look back at that series against the jazz and they're like oh joe ingles got the best of you like joe ingles man like it, no offense to him but like there shouldn't even be a conversation he shouldn't even be in his stratosphere so i just think like with paul george like you know with him potentially leaving the clippers if he's like frustrated low-key like behind the scenes like i feel like it's more so on him because I feel like this team's kind of given him everything he wanted I mean when Kawhi went down in 2021 he kind of was given I guess full reign same thing the year after when Kawhi was hurt and then for a good chunk of last season too and even the start of this season like he's kind of been given the keys to do most of what he wanted to do but of, of course he had his own injuries and he also just hasn't taken advantage of it in the last couple of years and that's why it seems like more and more that this trade with, you know, Paul George and SGA, like, leans in the Thunder's favor. Um, You know, the biggest part of that is that, like, the only reason it's really still a debate, I think, is because the fact that they got Paul George via trade is the reason they signed Kawhi Leonard in free agency. And that's kind of, like, the underlying part of it that maybe a lot of people don't see. But I just think if Paul George left the Clippers, it wouldn't be a great look on his resume, um, especially if he does put up another like stinker performance in the playoffs. Um, and if, I mean, if he went to the Sixers, I feel like that would be an interesting team. I don't know if they would be the favorite, but maybe it'd be like a team that 10 years from now people are using on 2k and they're like, we, we like this team. Like it looks cool, whatever. But, um, that's why I just think like in the playoffs, if this Clippers team is healthy, you know, and you're telling me Kawhi playing with Paul George, James Harden and Russell Westbrook, if these somehow win the championship behind Kawhi's lead, three guys that have been ridiculed in the playoffs for who knows how long, like you got to give him like a ton of credit. Like that that's at least my personal thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, um I mean, speaking of Paul George, you know, when he's at his at his best, at his highest ceiling, he's a really really good player. But I do think that Paul George does need to be more consistent, given, especially given the fact that he's the second best player behind Kawhi Leonard on that Clippers team. Mm. Yeah, I we just and also mm. uh, oh, you mentioned ahead. this too. You mentioned this too multiple times that the Clippers need to let Kawhi Leonard, you know, do his thing. Mm. Like if Kawhi, no, if I know Kawhi Leonard, it's gonna be hard for Kawhi Leonard to do this. But if, if when the playoffs come. And players like Paul George, Harden, or Westbrook, if those guys are really struggling, Kawhi Leonard, if he has to, he's going to have to get more involved, take more shots, and just take over if he has to, if that's what it's going to take for the Clippers to get the victory. Yeah, and the other thing I was just going to say is, like, we just need to see uh, Paul George kind of figure out his where he lines up with this team, which might seem crazy as the second-best player, but, like, when Kawhi – and Harden and even really Westbrook was playing like a lot of a big chunk of their like big hot streak Paul George was kind of out like he was hurt for so I think maybe part of that is like they found a rhythm without him so that might be the one thing where it's like you're integrating a player like that like that's just um something he's gonna have to adjust to I think but um yeah I don't know if you if you want here we can progress here a little bit more Celtics theme which I know uh, you'll be happy about, but, um, you know, Carmelo Anthony recently, uh, put out a quote basically saying that, you know, Paul Pierce, the truth just doesn't get enough credit. And maybe part of that is, you know, stuff that he said or done on his own. Um, but I'll ask you, like, do you agree or disagree that Paul George or Paul Pierce, <laughs> sorry, Paul Pierce doesn't get enough credit? You know what? I think, especially recently, Paul Pierce has actually become somewhat underrated. And I feel like that's largely due because when Paul Pierce was an analyst, 
all those times he said stuff like, oh, I was LeBron's toughest opponent. I was actually a better player, Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade just had a better career. Dwayne Wade only won more championships because he had better supporting cast and stuff like that. Um, I should be in this. I think he even mentioned about him being about the same conversation as Kobe. So I think that's why a lot of people <laughs> hasn't really shown any respect to Paul Pierce because when he was an analyst, he was saying some crazy stuff. But, you know, this isn't just for Paul Pierce, but for a lot of players who are great or at least really good. I think the issue is, is getting compared to only a selective players. Because while I want to put Paul Pierce in the same conversation as Dwayne Wade, Kobe, or LeBron, Paul Pierce, he was still a really good player. When he was in his prime from 2001 to 2007, I think he averaged about 25 points, five, six rebounds, and four assists. During that time frame from 2001 to 2007, I think the only players who averaged more points than Paul Pierce were Kobe, Allen Iverson, um, I think LeBron, and I believe Tracy McGrady. So less than mm-hmm. five players were averaging more points than Paul Pierce from 2001 to 2007. Um, I think every year from 2001 up until 2013, Pierce never averaged less than 18 points. At least 10 years of Pierce's career, he was no worse than an all-star caliber player. In four or five seasons, you can say he was an all-NBA caliber player. When he was at his peak, 2005, 2006, he was averaging around 25 or 26 points. And I think Paul Pierce, I think you can make an argument Paul Pierce in his prime was better than Vince Carter, Kamaro Anthony, Ray Allen, um, let's see, Kyle Lowry, DeRozan, um, Darren Williams. I'm probably missing a few players, but mm-hmm. those guys. Because, yeah, Paul Pierce in his air, he was never the best player, but he was still at least one of the top players when he was playing. Like, I would even say that Pierce would at least be in the same co- in his prime just as good as uh Tracy McGrady. Mhm. Yeah, I you know, I'm kind of like right there with that. I feel like he's also maybe doesn't get enough credit. Um you know, at least for me, I feel like Paul Pierce is a top 50 player ever, which maybe not a lot of people agree. Um you know, obviously he made the 75th anniversary team. Um, but at least for me, I feel like he is a top 50 player ever. I feel like of all those players that you were kind of like listing, like the comparisons with like that, maybe in his prime, you could argue he was better than like, I feel like he was better than all of them. Um, and even, you know, maybe Tracy McGrady, like his prime, you could argue was, you could argue was maybe better than Pierce's, but I feel like for a career, Paul Pierce definitely had, uh, the edge there. So, and I mean, this is a guy who showed up in the clutch, uh, I think of every player ever, if you add up clutch baskets and assists, I think he has the most in NBA history, uh, which says a lot, like at least a game winning one. So I feel like he's definitely someone who rises to the occasion. Yeah, maybe people will say, well, he only won one ring with the Celtics and they had the big three. But like at the end of the day, like that was still like a pretty impressive championship from start to finish that whole season. And it's not like that was the only like playoff moment or run he made because they had the biggest comeback in playoff history at the time in like 2002 against the Nets. And then like, uh, you know, really throughout that 2010 run, like a lot of those games, he put the team on his shoulders game five against the heat in 2012. So like, there's a lot of moments that you could look at. He had a game winner against the heat in 2010 as well. So like, there's a ton of moments that I feel like when you have that many and you're playing that well, like you said, like 18 points a game for 13 straight years, uh, which I feel like in more than modern era would probably more than likely be at least 20 points a game. He'd be taking more three pointers. Uh, so like all that considered, I feel like he definitely deserves more credit. You know what I mean? And he also had the one factor to him where it's like, um, it's a little bit similar, like how Luca like uses his body to score over his opponents. Like 
Paul Pierce kind of did too. Like maybe he wasn't the best athlete in the gym or anything like that, but like he kind of played the game smart in a way that caught people off guard, caught defenders on the wrong track. So, yeah, uh, Paul Pierce, like speaking of three point shooting, Paul Pierce, he was, he was actually a really good three point shooter. He can create his own shot beautifully around the, the perimeter I think actually for five seasons, he's averaged at least 25 points. Mm. And uh, I also want to add, uh, I'll take Paul Pierce in his prime over uh, Clay Thompson, Gilbert Arenas, Tony Parker, and Mino Ginobili. Yeah, that, that's tough because I like Ginobili. But, eh, I mean, I, I could definitely see it, I, I will say. But, yeah, I mean, of course he definitely. I do think he, Ginobili no. is Go underrated. Ahead, yeah. He, he definitely. Uh, speaking of Ginobili, I will say that <laughs> ahead, he's underrated. Ahead. Yeah, Ginobili, I will say that you know, he's underrated, especially when Ginobili was in his prime. Mm-hmm. The thing with Ginobili is he uh, maybe the stats or like the accolades don't jump out as much, but um, you know if he was given maybe a like he would kind of play within the system the best way that you could. I feel like if you wanted him to go out and be the leader of your team. He could do that because he's shown you could do that too. So um, it's a little bit interesting, uh, but I can definitely, I think Paul Pierce is probably seen as like a greater player all time. And I would probably say so as well, but um, yeah, it's, it, it's a tough one, but I agree with the others. I think for sure over clay over Tony Parker over um, Gilbert arenas, like you said. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Paul Pierce is the truth for a reason. So we gotta, we gotta give him his credit. So, I don't know. Is there anything you else you wanted to peak, add in there? Peak, yeah. Uh, who do you think peaked higher, Paul Pierce or Melo? Because, you know, Melo, he was averaging around 20 points at his peak. Mm-hmm. I – that's a good question. But I would probably still say Paul Pierce. But it's close. Like, I think they're within, like, five – placements or so on my all-time list like they're probably some of the closest small forwards i have on my all-time list so like to one another so it's tough but yeah uh if you if you want though we can move on to this uh mini game the nba jersey number mini game um so this is kind of an interesting one so i'm gonna give uh my guy sports wikipedia here there's 10 players i have um and i'm just gonna say their name um and what depending on the player who i say like their name like let's say i say uh lebron james and all his jersey numbers in his career were number six and number 23 so you have to try and give me a player that's number six or number 23 if you don't give me a player that's exactly that number you can get points if you're close so if you get the exact number like you get another number 23 then you'll get 10 points. If you're one digit away from one of his numbers, you'll get eight points, three digits away, six points, five digits away, five points, 10 digits away, four points, 20 digits away, two points. And within 25 digits, you get one point. If you're further than that, you won't get any points for that question, but there are 10 questions. Um, And the only other rule I have on here is if I give you a current player, then you have to give me an answer that's a current player as well. And it could be any jersey number they've ever wore. So, uh, with all that said, are you ready? (laughs) Yep. Alrighty. So, I think it's only fitting that the first one we start with is a Celtic, a current Celtic. Uh, And I also cannot tell you uh, the jersey number of the player I'm going to name here. So, I guess that's kind of just on you to interpret it. But the first player is Jason Tatum. And so your goal is to give me a current player uh, that's either close to his jersey number or spot on. Uh, Jamal Murray. Okay, so your answer Wait, is... Wait, no, no, I mean... Uh, oh, what were you going to say? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Oh, I, I no, can... go, go ahead. Okay. I don't know why I said Murray. Um... Well, I'll, I'll, what were you what were you gonna say though? <laughs> I, I was gonna say Damian Lillard. 
I'll, I'll I'll let you pick Damian Lillard. There's not like a lock in answer here though, but Damian Lillard did wear number zero, so you are correct. So you will get ten points for that one. So that that that's kind of how it works. But yeah, um, so the second one. Uh, could also be easy. I will say eventually they get harder and we'll get in the former players here in a bit. But the second one is Chris Paul. Mm. It could also be a jersey number, like a current player's former jersey number that you can say as well, if that makes sense. Um, Bradley Bill. So you went with Bradley Beal, number three. Chris Paul was also number three. So that's another 10 points. Nice. Starting off strong, 20 points right now. Uh, next one might get a little bit harder, and that is uh, Contavious Caldwell Pope. Now, I will say he's wore two different numbers, so you, can, you have multiple chances here, I guess. Well, like only one guess, but you could get closer on either number really. I'm not going to lie. I have no idea what number he wears. Yeah. I, I feel like most people wouldn't to be honest. Like, so I guess like you gotta put on your best guess of like what, what number you think he would be and then who would be uh, fit that criteria, I guess. I will say the numbers are kind of close, but they're not like exact, obviously. I'm thinking. Sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> I'm just going to say a random player. I'm just going to say Jalen Brown. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, that's that is a fair one. So you went with uh, Jalen Brown. He wears number seven. Um, KCP. His jersey numbers are number one and number five. Uh, so you were two digits away. So because you were within three digits, you still get six points for that one, though. So pretty respectable still. Yeah, KCP was a little bit of a hard one. Um, the uh, the next one might be also kind of hard. Uh, there's two more current players. Then we'll go to the former players. The former players also start a little bit easier, and then they move on and get harder. So the fourth one is <laughs> Davis Bertans. <laughs> this one probably could have been the last one for current players, but yeah, he's wore three different numbers in his career. Mm. I'm thinking. I will say that the hint is, uh, I guess his current number is like the lowest of the three numbers too that he's wore. <laughs> Not that that I guess matters too much, but <laughs> I'm just gonna say Devin Booker. I... Okay, so Devin Booker. As war number one, uh, Davis Bertans, his numbers are 9, 42, and 44. Actually, 9 is his current number, too. Uh, so that is within... Oh, I could have said Derek White. You could you could have said Derek White. That is true. But uh, within 10 yeah, digits, that would have been... still uh, still four points. That's still not, not too bad. Uh, if he didn't wear number 9, though, that probably would have been tough. Um, but, uh, okay. Uh, the fifth one, though... Now, this guy's only wore one jersey number in his career, uh, and it's Evita Zubac. That's part of the reason I put this one fifth, because I feel like there's only one number to think of. It might be kind of hard. Hmm.
Hmm. This one's kind of tough. <laughs> trying to think of like a good hint maybe um okay i'll say his his jersey number was like higher his jersey number is higher than what pick he was in the draft if that helps i'm just gonna say luca so you went with Luka Doncic, number 77. It was good thinking because it was a high number, but unfortunately, Zubac is number 40. So that that is a tough one. But that was the hardest current one, I think, for sure. Um, I think Bertans is also kind of tough because he, you know, has weird numbers. But maybe, like, having more numbers is, like, more leeway. But uh, So you still got 30 points right now. We're going to move on to some former players. It's going to start off easier and get harder as well. So the first one of the of the former players, and again, you have to answer these ones with a former player too, and that is Michael Jordan. Um, Hold on, because I'm trying to think of a player. Because uh, the player I'm thinking of, I'm not for sure if he wore it. Uh, okay, um, World Be Free. I don't know if you know who that is. All right, so World Be Free. I do know who that is, but let me see. Uh, jersey number. So he wore number 21, 24, and he did wear 12. And because Michael Jordan wore number 12 on the game where his jersey got stolen, you get the 10 points for that one. So that that is a good one. I put in 12 in there like last second kind of for the, for the Jordan one. So uh, that was good. But either way, I mean, he was still close to uh, 23 anyways. So uh, next one, though, is Walt Frazier, who actually wore two different jersey numbers. But they're kind of. Already got close. my player. You already got it. Yeah, Tim Hardaway. Tim Hardaway, and that is correct. Another ten points on the board. Um, yeah, it was a big one. He wore ten with the Knicks, and then he wore eleven with the Cavs, which I feel like people for we 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 kind of forget about Walt Frazier there because it was near <laughs> the end. Um, so this next one's kind of interesting. Um. This guy wore four different jersey numbers, but a little bit of a slept-on all-star in the past, and that's Dale Ellis. I think he played for the Sonics. He did, he did yes. Uh, and he wore four different jersey numbers. They're all relatively in the same ballpark, though, jersey number-wise. I'm thinking. <laughs> You're good. Hmm. Um, trying to see if I can give like what maybe hint I can give if any. Okay, one of this guy's jersey numbers was the draft pick he was. I'm just going to say uh, Charles Barkley. All right. So Charles Barkley was your answer. So Charles Barkley, I believe he wore a couple jer different jersey numbers, including 32, 34, and 4. Dale Ellis wore numbers 2, 3, 9, and 14. So you were within one on that one. So you did get eight points for that one because you were within one digit. 
So that's pretty good. Uh, I Let me check real quick. I think Dale Ellis, I think three might have been his most prominent number. Yes, it was. So, yep. And then Charles Barkley Wars four with the Rockets. So that was good. Um, now, the last two here, these ones are going to spice up a little bit, more so role players. Uh, but this guy had four different jersey numbers. A lot of them are pretty spread out, though. And that's Ursan Ilyasova. I know he's more so recent, but again, you got to give me a former player. And I, I think I said he has four, he wore four different jersey numbers in his career as well. Two of the numbers are kind of similar, though. I'm just going to name a random player. I'm just going to say Ray Allen. All right. So Ray Allen is the choice. So throughout Ray Allen's career, he wore number 34 and number 20. And Ersan Ilyasova wore numbers 7, 19, 23, and 77. So you were within one again uh, with that 19 pull. Um, so that's another eight points on that one. So that, you're, you're kind of, you're doing really good. Uh now, the last one, another kind of role player. Uh, I feel like this guy wore three really weird numbers, at least two really weird numbers. Um, and the last one is Scott Pollard. I'm trying to think like what a, what would what would be a good hint for this one? Um Well, all his jersey numbers are above his draft pick. That's for one. Um but yeah, so there are three numbers. At least two of them are kind of weird. I feel like one of them is more common maybe today a little bit. But not like super common. <laughs> I'm going to say Dirk Okay, so you went with Dirk, uh, obviously wore number 41 throughout his career. Uh, Scott Pollard wore numbers 31, 62, and 66. So you were just within 10 digits, so you did get four points on this one as well. Um, So that's not bad. Yeah, Scott Pollard, he wore, I feel like people kind of wear 31. Like, it's not super rare, but 62 and 66, I can't think of really anybody that wore 62 or 66 other than them um but yeah so overall you got uh 30 points on the first five and on the last five you got uh 40 points so brings your grand total to 70 points overall that's a pretty good score how do you feel about that uh fine i guess (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's kind of weird. Like, see, some of the ones are, like, eventually, like, they're just kind of odd ones. Like, Ursan Ilyasova, Scott Pollard, uh, the Zubach one, I I think that was probably maybe the toughest one just because it's like there's only one number and you got to narrow it down. But overall, I mean, I think you did pretty good. Um, And, yeah, this is the first time I've done this game. So, I guess you're the the king right now. You're the all-time leader. So there's that. Um, but yeah, uh, overall, I thought it was a good show, a good performance in the mini game. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Thank you guys for watching. You got any other, uh, final thoughts before we let this thing, uh, go? Nope. All righty. Um, and yeah, you guys can check out sports Wikipedia. I'll have his stuff down below. Go subscribe to him and his banger content. Uh, but yeah, uh i think that's gonna do it for us again hope you guys enjoy thank you guys for watching and we're out peace